Welcome everybody to St. Luke's Sunday Forum. I am thrilled that you are here and I'm really thrilled to have as my guest and our conversational partner, Diana Butler Bass. She's a friend of long standing. Uh, we have gone through a lot together, including she's gone with me to Pando and that'll have to be another conversation some other Sunday. But let me tell you about her and just in case. She is a historian of religion. She is an expert about American religion. She is a wonderful public thinker looking at the intersection of religion, spirituality, and culture. She's the author of 11 books on American religion. She uh, is the author of Christianity After Religion, one of my favorites, the book Grateful, the book Grounded, which is real faith in the real world, a people's history of Christianity, a wonderful exposure of the real story about Christianity. And her newest book, Freeing Jesus, comes out on March 30. And about that book, Anne Lamott has said, Diana Butler Bass is one of America's greatest living Christian thinkers. Freeing Jesus is a paradigm shifting work on Jesus Christ that should be required reading for every Christian. And if you want to keep up with Diana Butler Bass, um, you've been seeing some of her books uh, on the screen. If you want more information and up to date current information, go to Substack newsletter, S U B S T A C K newsletter, and then type in uh, Diana Butler Bass. Without further ado, Diana, welcome. Oh, Ed, it's so wonderful to see you. What, especially in this really interesting, amazing uh, time, and what's been uh, for many people uh, a, a a week where we can breathe a little differently. So I live outside of Washington D.C., as you know, and so um, we've had quite uh, quite the month. Uh, I I mean. I've been breathing deeply here in Atlanta and the Deep South in Birmingham, and I can only imagine the vibrations that have, you have been experiencing in the metropolitan D.C. area. Yeah, people have talked about the three Wednesdays so far of yep. uh, 2021, insurrection, impeachment, and inauguration. And I keep thinking, well, what could the fourth Wednesday be? And I, I, I was also thinking about being with you, and I thought, Oh, maybe we could do illumination or. <laughs> <laughs> we do have to keep it starting with an eye. I. I like that. <laughs> so, or is inspiration, something, <laughs> something like that. I, I'll I'd take be them. all up for that as the fourth Wednesday. I'll take them both. Let's do it. Good deal. So everybody, I want to tell you a little bit about the very holy, uh, holy spirit led choreographed way that this happened. So those of you who heard my sermon last Sunday on Martin Luther King Sunday, know that I'd spent a great deal of time with an above the fold article for the Sunday New York Times, which had come out on Saturday, about how the, the insurgency had been funded and the deep and broad roots of it. Um, it was an intriguing, intriguing article, and we'll put the link for it up on the screen. I commend it to you. It is a lengthy, lengthy New York Times article. It's worth reading. Then, beat number two. I saw the New Yorker video that came out of the activity that was going on with about 20 people uh, and one Capitol Police person in the Senate chamber, and then the guy who had the horns on and the sheep's clothing and all that kind of stuff, bare chested, going up to the president's seat in the Senate and kind of taking over and then calling for prayer. And he had five people around him and he led a prayer that for all purposes of recognition could have been prayed in my childhood evangelical church environments, including 
praying in the name of Jesus Christ. And my mind literally exploded. What? This was a religious expression? And then, friends, no joke, I got a text from my friend Diana Butler Bass the next day saying, when can we talk? <laughs> and I said, oh, my God, the Holy Spirit's working double time. So I called Diana. We had a Zoom meeting, and she told me about how the insurrection, the capital siege, that murderous, deadly riot, that act of American terrorism had was a was a religious expression was an expression of some religious dynamics that are in our human family in the United States so here we and I said oh Diana we have to have this conversation for the forum and she happened to be free and I'm deeply deeply grateful so Diana, let's start. Number one, thank you for being an instrument of the Holy Ghost. And then let's talk about the what you told me about Catholicism, evangelical Protestantism, and the spiritual but not religious groupings. Well, you talk about it. What are the major groups of religion in America right now? Um, the three largest... Uh, so slices of the American religion pie are those of white Catholics, white evangelicals, and people who are religiously non-affiliated. So if you, you drew a pie chart, those would be the, the three largest slices. And um, it, there's, there's a little bit of debate about what the, the percentages are, but it's, it's roughly about 17% uh, white Catholics, 17% white evangelicals. And now the, the unaffiliated, that doesn't just include white people, that, that includes people of color as well. Um, and that group is around 26 or 27% of the population. So, so that's, the biggest, that's the biggest group. Uh, for our group, for our audience, you all might be interested in knowing that the, the white mainline, which most of the Episcopal Church is, uh, that's roughly 15, somewhere 14 or 15%. So we're kind of on the tails of those three large slices. Um, and so, so I think that it's important to kind of keep that idea in your mind is that as I talk about uh, religion, we're talking about a very sort of large uh, percentage of the American population. And if you put these three groups together, of course, you get a significant number of, of people. So that's, that's kind of the basic nuts and bolts of the, the structure um, of American religion right now. Then go to the next step and how the energies that were expressed in the riot are, have been in these three major pies already. Yeah, can pie, I? Pie pieces. <laughs> I'm going to back up just one second sure, and get a, a little piece of sort of background information that I didn't actually talk to you about when we, we talked on the phone. Um, I was in graduate school in the late 1980s. And, uh, you know, the late 1980s are the time in which the religious right had really come to the fore. And everybody finally knew the sort of the language of the moral majority and Jerry Falwell's name and Pat Robertson's name, even though just 10 years previous in the 1970s, these uh, people and the idea of a empowered Christian right, um, you know, nobody even was thinking about that in 1978. But by the time I was there at graduate school in 1988, it was all anybody could talk about. And um, in grad school, or maybe shortly thereafter, I'm a little hazy on the data, I'd have to go and check, check out those books behind me. Uh, Robert Wolf now, who was one of the uh, most amazing uh, professors of sociology of American religion in the end of the 20th and beginning of the 21st century, uh, wrote a book about the realignment of American religion in the 1980s. And uh, that book was very powerful and influences still the way that many people think about 
of religion and politics. And his argument was that the old way of thinking about American religious communities as sort of you know mainline Protestant or evangelical Protestant or Roman Catholic, these old theological identifiers no longer worked. And that within every single grouping of those traditional identifiers, there were lines of fracture. And he identified those lines between political conservatives and political uh, liberals. And what he said is that going forward for the next, you know, for the foreseeable future, what we're going to have is not a Catholic political opinion or an evangelical political opinion or a mainline political opinion, but we're going to have two different voices of conflicting opinion. And what will happen is it won't be that all Catholics agree but all conservative Catholics will find themselves in agreement with conservative evangelicals and conservative mainliners and the same on the liberal side. And so his then uh, provocative thesis was that American religion was being realigned on political, along political lines. And you know that proved to be right and prophetic in the Episcopal church we have uh, example after example of how that worked, particularly in the 1990s and the early aughts. And so, so what now wrote this book? And um, that was in the back of my mind. I didn't realize that when we were talking, but I was thinking what's happening now um, potentially is a new realignment of American religion with a very unexpected partner uh, that has come up um, in the mix. What would you name that partner? Well, the, th the three partners now um, in, I think what we saw um, at, the, at the Capitol are the politically energized white evangelical community, which is the heir of what Wathnow wrote about, the heir of the moral majority. And we saw that it, it was the heir of the moral majority, you know, in the fact that um, Jerry Falwell Jr. has been so much part of Trump politics, um, opening the door in white evangelicalism for that. And then also, of course, uh, Billy Graham's son, Franklin Graham, um, Pat Robertson, who interestingly enough had supported Trump up till this resurre uh, resurrection, up to the insurrection, um, he backed, uh, Robertson backed off in the last month uh, with the election stuff, uh, which has been really interesting. But up until then, he was, you know, pro Trump all the way. And so has uh, Christian Broadcasting Network. So we see, we've seen that. And we're familiar with that piece. And we're also, I think, uh, slightly familiar with conservative Catholicism. Uh, which we can talk about a little bit more as we move forward. But that by and large has been identified with single issue um, anti-abortion politics, you know, over this long period. And that began developing in the 80s. There's a different Catholic voice. There's a different white Catholic voice. There's a different white evangelical voice, the liberal voices. But these two conservative communities are familiar to us. And those are the two things that was now talked about and they were present in that riot. The third thing, and I, this was the one I think that kind of blew my mind and really surprised you too, is since so many people in the United States now are religiously unaffiliated, I believe that the most recent percentage of people who call themselves spiritual but not religious is something like 22% of the population. And religiously unaffiliated, like I said, is 26 or 27% of the population. Um, that, that means that over, over there in the religiously unaffiliated part of the population, there are people who have all kinds of different opinions about God, about spirituality, about church, synagogue, temple, all those things. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of a catch-all community uh, for people who just don't have traditional religious views and are uncomfortable with institutional forms of religion. Now, because of that, there's, there's a lot of flow over there. And one of the things that I had certainly noticed over the last four years was within the spiritual but not religious, the unaffiliated community, there's a lot of interest in mysticism, 
and you know that would include lots of our friends who are really great people who would never find themselves at the insurrection in the capital uh, but there's a lot of in interest in mysticism and there's a lot of interest in sort of pre-christian forms of religion and so and e you even see this in some forms of christianity you know in the episcopal church there's a lot of people who are very interested in celtic spirituality well that interest is over with with uh, the religiously unaffiliated as well. There's also interest in uh, sort of Scandinavian pre-Christian religions. There's interest in things like uh, Druid uh, practices. Uh, there's all kinds of things over there. And what I had been noticing since the Trump, um, since Trump became president is that a good number of people who were religiously unaffiliated, who were white supremacists, people, for example, at the Charlottesville um, riot mess debacle, uh, were waving and using these kinds of symbols of pre-Christian European paganism. You know, things that I had seen, you know, friends kind of just you know, have in their offices, you know, and, and it certainly had nothing to do with white supremacy there. We're only kind of, you know, tokens or symbols of kind of an interest in mysticism and alternative forms of religion. But here, what I saw in Charlottesville was some of that stuff being picked up by white supremacists and being used symbolically as a sort of reinforcement of their uni universe. And, um, that tendency has increased over the last four years. I mean, I sort of noticed it a little bit with Charlottesville, but then as you know, I kind of keep an eye on some of these right-wing groups, um, you began to see uh, people who, for example, on Twitter or Facebook, um, I don't really get to parlor very often, but they will use like little avatar pictures of Norse gods, for example, or, um, Sadly enough, uh, right behind me here, I have a Celtic cross that is given to me by our mutual friend Marcus Borg, and um, it, it, that the Celtic cross in some circles of Aryan white supremacy um, is their primary religious symbol. It makes me sick to my stomach when I see it, but it is also a thing. So, at the rally on epiphany um there were very because we're used to seeing these things because we still live in a country with a very substantial christian memory so the first thing we notice in a, a kind of a political moment like that and a crisis moment like that is we see the christian symbolism so we saw the cross being erected we saw the jesus flags we saw people who were praying like christians pray and so like all the first stories were, oh, here they are. Here's that, you know, kind of the radical edge of white evangelicalism showing up at this, this, this Trump rally and then showing up at the Capitol and becoming violent. And then there was also very quickly a good number of Catholic commentators who talked about how Catholic symbolism was, was present um, at, at that rally. And we certainly saw that at the Republican National Convention in over the summer, some pretty radical right-wing Catholics were put up um, on stage in that convention. And uh, then uh, James Martin at, from America and the former editor of National Catholic uh, Reporter talked about how uh, different uh, symbols were obvious to them of people who were involved in the anti-abortion movement and how that was present physically at the, at the Capitol. Now that shouldn't surprise any of us. That's Robert Wuthnow's old thesis. But then there was a shaman, you know, dressed like some sort of, you know, imagined Norse pre-Christian pagan priest. And as you notice, you know, he got up and did a prayer, which sounded a little bit like something from a charismatic or Southern Baptist church, but he was dressed in this, you know, sort of the, this outfit that hearkened to this whole different symbolic universe. And um, 
as I kind of scanned the crowd in terms of the videos that were available, you could see some of these other things. You, it, the people who have moved in this direction, this kind of radical right-wing pre-Christian, um, what I would call pan-European pagan nationalism, which they believe is the real religion of white people, um, that all this Christian stuff came later. And if you want to be truly white, if you want to be true to what it really means to be European, you're going to strip away even Protestantism, even Catholicism, and you're going to go back to this stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they, like I said, they, they wear animal skins. It's not uncommon uh, to see uh, these kinds of uh, tattoos that we sometimes associate with white supremacy of the, of the Celtic cross. Um, they do tend to carry things like, you know, spears and swords. Um, you know, it's a, they have created a, a visual wardrobe, as it were of uh, what they imagine pre-European religion to look like. And it's mystical, it's highly what I would call romantic in the sense that they have reconstructed a past um, in a way that they want it reconstructed. Um, in the same way, sometimes Catholics or uh, reconstruct the Middle Ages or Protestants reconstruct the Protestant Reformation. We imagine it as the most perfect of all times and that None of those people could ever do anything wrong. And we want to go back to, you know, if you're a Protestant, you want to go back to you know, 1517 or Catholic, you want to go back to 1200. Well, these people want to go back to 400 BC, you know, <laughs> and, um, and they, they really want the tribal religions of ancient Scandinavian countries and ancient Celtic sort of belief and ancient Gaul before the Romans got there. And they were present at this rally. And I, it made my eyes pop out because then I thought, oh my gosh, is the kind of neo-pagan, deeply mystical, somewhat romantic pre-Christian Europe stuff, is that actually becoming divided in the same way Protestants and Catholics once did into a kind of a, a, a radical nationalist fashion. I, I hate using the word conservative because I know lots of good conservatives. And so it's, it's not really that it's, it's a kind of, you know, it's a, it's a virulent uh, nationalist kind of vision. Um, and then, you know, kind of the nice neo-pagans, so the ones of your and my acquaintance that we work on social justice causes with. And so I thought, oh my gosh, is that really happening in that pool of people who are spiritual but not religious. And that to me is a question, but it certainly is something that I have noticed. And there was one article written in the wake of the, the, the insurrection about that. It appeared in Rolling Stone. And uh, the person who wrote the article said, uh, wow, you know, who, who knew that uh, sort of neo-pagan uh, nationalism was a thing. And then they went through and sort of cited many of these same things that I had had seen as well. So, so is this part of a religious realignment? Is this something we can expect going into the future? Is this kind of a replay of the old what now thesis um, in a new guise? And I think these are important questions to ask. Wow. So, Diana, there are so many therefores that I want to ask you moving forward. Before that, I want to go back to the terrain that you've just described. I want to make, because because there was a lot there, I want to make sure, and, and I've heard it in general a little bit from you, not with that kind of beautiful uh, specificity. Um, however, I want to make, I just want to make sure I understand it. And, and before I restate it, I want to feed it back to you and you tell me if I got it right. I just want to make sure that our viewers are hearing me say that <clears throat> this Sunday New York Times article that I keep referring to, which talked about how that event of January 6th was funded 
and that it was funded by some deep pockets, but funded mostly or maybe equally by tons of $5, $10, $15 donations to all of the groups that you've just mentioned. And I just want not to be a person who's in denial about the reality of what's going on. Because if it was there sufficient in number to show up on January 6th in Washington, D.C., it is there in sufficient potency to go underground and come back up once stirred. But it, and, and a lot of commentators are saying, the dynamics are so powerful that they may have grown since January 6th simply because it's attractive to be doing that. So I just want everybody who's listening to understand that we're talking about something real. We're talking about a division in three major areas of the religious scene, or you use the metaphor pie in America, the um, white Protestant evangelicalism, white Catholicism, and then the religiously unaffiliated, and back to the first two categories, that there have been significant priests and ministers who have gotten up in their pulpits, and I've had people write me and tell me that this happened to them, to say, if you vote in the democratic way, you will go to hell. And they did that with a straight face. Yes. They were truly serious. It is religious fear mongering. It is partisanship in the worst rank order. And that that showed up in Washington on Epiphany on January 6th as well as all this other stuff, which is an amalgam of pre-European, uh, pre pre-Christian, uh, pre pre-Christian pre pagan mysticism, um, Norse, and on and on and on, using symbolism in an amazing way. And I just wanted to tag that the people who are being arrested, and particularly this man, the shaman we, we, we've been referring, referring to that Rolling Stone really impacts. Poli uh, law enforcement authorities are looking at the tattoos of right. these folks. Not only the, the flags people were carrying, not only the decals that were on their flak jackets, but also the tattoos. In his case, he was going around bare chested, showing off his tattoos. And finally, um, just to, to note that um, one of the ways that they were doing what they needed to do to scrub the um, military, US military, 25,000 strong, they needed to scrub them of anybody who would participate in some kind of crazy violence on Inauguration Day was to take a look at their history of their tattoos. And so the symbolism you're, you're unveiling for us is just a real thing. Now, yeah. did, you, did I get that right? Yeah. And it's really interesting because, you know, the more I've been talking about this with you, you know, the more that I'm realizing is as well. Um, I think it's really important to see the difference between 1988 and the what now thesis, liberals versus conservatives, sort of realigning on the saw away from denominational names towards political names. I think that what's what's happened here, and certainly you see it, I see it all the time because of the people I, I know personally and the things I write about um, is that it's, it's no, within what used to be 
um, conservative evangelicalism or conservative white Catholicism, there are actually new divides. And so those divides are basically pro-Trump and anti-Trump. And so there are some very interesting people who still are, I mean, they're, they're, they're white, ethnically, racially, um, and they're still fairly conservative. A uh, person like, uh, I think, is what's his name? Knapp uh, New, Newsworth, or I can't remember his last name, Nowworth, um, who wrote for Christian Post and who had to quit uh, because he wasn't sufficiently pro-Trump enough, but he, he's a really co pretty conservative Protestant guy. I've talked to him. We have a lot of theological differences, but we actually have a, a similarity in, in what we believe to be the common good. But we even still get at that differently because he's still politically conservative and I'm still politically liberal, but, but we're able to talk. We really are able to achieve what Joe Biden was talking about, about unity. You know, we might disagree, we come about policies differently, but we see the world through the same set of, uh, of lenses that I would hope um, are what we call reality, that there's some correspondence between what we see and what is present factually in the world. And so the, the new divide among conservative evangelicals is between people like him or Mark Golly, who used to be the editor of Christianity Day and who came out with that scathing editorial against Trump several months ago. Uh, Mark has actually wound up converting to Catholicism, interestingly enough, because mm. he felt so cast out <laughs> of evangelicalism mm. with all of this. Mm. Um, but you know, Mark is another one of those people. Uh, I actually know him personally. We've known each other since we were in our 20s and we've had huge political and, and theological disagreements that entire time. But nevertheless, Mark sees the world through a set of lenses that correspond with reality. Now, that's not happening. There's a whole bunch of other white evangelicals who have adopted other kinds of stories and different lenses. And all I can do right now at this point is refer to them as the sort of the Trumpian evangelicals, is that they've decided that reality, that what we normally understand to be reality isn't, and that they live in a completely different universe. And that's also happened in white Catholicism. And so it's no longer, and I, I, I hope that this really helps people at St. Luke's, it's no longer conservative versus liberal. It's people who used to be part of a conservative coalition, but that coalition is now breaking up. And it's breaking up around this idea of what is real, what is true. And the people who have followed uh, Trump and other politicians like him into a space of alternative reality, those are the people who I think are forming a, a new coalition with these kind of post-religious, neo-pagan, spiritual but not religious types over in this field, um, this third group of American religion. And over there, I think that's the same thing is that you might have somebody who's fairly, con you know, politically conservative, who is all religious. And you might have, um, you know, someone, of course, who is political, you have a lot of political liberals in that space. But then there is what we saw at the insurrection, some percentage, it's impossible to tell. I don't think anybody's done surveys on this. As far as I knew, I was the only person who was paying any attention to it. Um, there is some small percentage of people who have joined in this sort of Trumpian alternative reality circle and have embraced uh, visions, political visions uh, based on that. And so I, I, so it's a kind of an interesting moment when traditional conservatives of the type that what now uh, once identified as dividing denominations, I think those traditional conservatives are actually, some of them, you see it in the Lincoln Project, certainly, I've seen it in different friend groups, some of them are actually reaching out back towards their more liberal friends saying, hey, I can't be over here anymore, because these people that I used to trust no longer believe in reality. And, you know, sort of a mark of that would be what you just said, um, and that is, hearing a preacher say from the pulpit, if you don't, if you, if you vote for a Democrat, you're going to hell. 
And I've heard tons of that too. I mean, I, I literally think millions and millions and millions of Americans were told that before the, right before the election. Um, the piece that happens over here with these kinds of, you know, neo-Norse, neo-pagan, neo-Druid Trumpers um, is that it isn't about the threat of hell. This is, it makes them a little different than these evangelicals and Catholics. Uh, but instead, the threat is that you're basically a race traitor or a, a traitor to your ethnicity because they're, they're not holding the keys of heaven and hell. They're not holding the keys of eternal life. What they're holding is the keys of your culture. And so what they're saying to people who are sort of um, attracted you know, to this, this group is that you know, come with us and we're going to let you be white. You know, we're gonna let you embrace everything there is about being European. And not only that, but we're gonna show you the real secrets of it. It's kind of a Gnostic sort of moment. And so here with us, you can be the truest of all Europeans. And one day we are going to rise up and we are going to reassert uh, the, 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 the power, the beauty, the, the authority, of Europeanness um, over the the whole of the Western world, and uh, you know, for 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 white people who are, um, you know, a little, I, I, all white people right now are are dealing with questions raised by our culture and race, and you know, trying to sort of re-adjudicate our own histories. Every thoughtful white person I know is doing that, and so it's it's very hard work. And you know, I, I, I still want to love, you know, and I still do love uh, an amazing number of European traditions, things I've inherited from my family. I think that, you know, gifts of Western Europe, many of them have been amazing and the world is better for, for those gifts. Um, but I also see that those gifts were accompanied with some very bad things. And so, you know, working through that sorting out process right now. A lot of people don't want to do all that work, you know, and so instead they just say, uh, you know, to heck with it. Um, you know, if the if the politically correct uh, cancel culture, uh, Black Lives Matter crowd thinks that I'm based, my culture is hell. I'm just going to go over there and hang out with people who believe that European culture is a good thing. And um, they get kind of roped into this. They kind of, I think they kind of get pulled, pulled down into this sinkhole because they're not willing to do the necessary, you know, sort of work of the moment on our history and culture, if you happen to be European background like you and me. And so, so anyway, that's the threat that this group holds over other white people is that you're not, you're a traitor, you, you've betrayed. Uh, the your ancestors, and there's a kind of hell in that, you know. Um, I, I know both you and I have experienced issues with our own families when we talk about, you know, Black Lives Matter, or we talk about being sad about the history of racism or complicities that are in our own families. I mean, I have a brother who won't talk to me. Um, who lives in Georgia, by the way. Hello, Atlanta. Um, <laughs> I have a brother who lives in Georgia who, who literally won't speak to me and believes that I'm a traitor. And, and so, so it's a similar kind of use of fear, but it's a different mechanism because there's no classical belief in heaven and hell in the same way that um, Protestantism and Catholicism has those mechanisms. What they do believe in, however, is the glory of the warrior. And, you know, warriors will go to Valhalla, you know, they will sit with the gods. And so the shaman, that's one of the things that he's summoning um, by his body is that he is saying that he's part of that warrior culture. He's a priest of that warrior culture and that participating in this particular battle is one of those sort of ticket stamping moments where you could, where you're both being the truest of all Europeans and you're also being, um, you know, just getting a, a, a stamp on your card so that you'll sit with the gods in Valhalla at the end. 
so much. So two big things that I want to return to. So that's not conservatism. That was my main point. I, if anybody is listening to this who is politically conservative and you're, you go to church where Ed Bacon is a minister, God bless you. Uh, you know? <laughs> so that means you, you aren't, you aren't these people. And what, what those of us who are more liberal, uh, socially, politically, theologically need to understand. So we need to be able to sort this out so that we know who our real friends are. We know how we can move ahead on the common good and, and we can together uh, defeat something that has arisen among us. Uh, that's, that's really quite deeply disturbing. I do want to emphasize that and then go back to two other things and then go forward. Okay, and I'll try to be quicker. <laughs> no, 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 you're perfect. You're perfect. You're perfect. The re-emphasis, though, is that as we seek at St. Luke's to embody an authentic big tent, otherwise known as Anglican comprehensiveness, or as Tutu says, the messiness of Anglicanism, that in the conversations we're having, where I am saying to my brothers and sisters whom I adore on the level of the heart, who voted for Trump because of conservativeness, not because of this other stuff, that the old distinctions between conservative and liberal are really up in the air right now. And the divisions that are promoting violence and an unreality, right. a detachment from truth, that's a something very, very different from the old paradigms of liberal and conservative. That's Do I have exactly. you right about that? That is exactly correct. Okay. So having said that, Let's backtrack just a minute because I want to get into, again, on a deeper level, this really brilliant illumination that you've given us about what now substitutes for heaven and hell as the threat and the reward and punishment. I want to get to that. But before we go back to that, which was very impressive and insightful and new, can we talk a little bit, Diana, about the religious motivation to detach from truth, to detach from reality, and to actually believe that Trump won the election when something like 66 courts and court cases ratified in the judicial process that Biden had become the president-elect. And then we have even people at the senatorial and the congressional level joining with the fiction, the true artifice that Trump had won. That, and, and, and there's a relationship between that and a distrust of Dr. Fauci and the science and wearing masks and saying that that is going to really help us keep alive. You know, what, please speak to the religious stuff about the detachment from fact, science, and reality. Oh, well, that would be like an entire college course. Of course. It <laughs> but um, I think the simplest thing for people to keep in mind is that Trump did not cause that, but that Trumpian politics exploited something that was already present in our culture. And, uh, you know, Ed, you and I have been talking about this for quite a long time, and a lot of other people who are in our circles had been talking about it, is that we had come to the end of part of the historical timeline. We have been talking about postmodernism or post enlightenment for a, a long time. And that's what, where we are. We're, we're, we're at a historical junction where what was sort of the organization of, of culture around certain assumed norms and practices that began disappearing, you know, 50 or 70 years ago. 
and slowly, you know, we've been seeing the the implications of that unfold um, in the on a, in the culture all around us on a daily basis, and um, that big part of that unfolding is the question about what constitutes truth and scholars i knew you know back at duke university when i was in graduate school in the 80s um were people who said uh we don't know you know we have no idea how this is going to going to turn out and we're just going to pursue these this new philosophical pathways anyway um, and then there were other people who were saying, well, wait a second, we can't live like that as a society and we have to reassert truth um, and we have to reassert the enlightenment. And there was big fights, you know, in, among philosophers and cultural critics and all sorts of people um, about this very thing. And, and they were never solved. Literally, the best philosophers in the world have never really come up with an answer to the, the question that you're asking. In other words, we are living in the time of history where we are fighting about the nature of reality and there we have no consensus about it and so, so i think that you know for myself what what i have tried to do with this moment um is that i'm primarily trained as a historian and so so i refer to this as a moment of what i call historical dislocation that is we we aren't where we were and we're not where we're going to be and um, in moments of dislocation, you and I actually know what to do <laughs> with moments of dislocation, is that in our tradition, our religious tradition, we refer to that as liminal space. And so it, limit, in liminal space between what was and what will come to be, there are sets of practices in all of the world's great religions that help people navigate liminal space in healthy and life-giving ways. Uh, practices of grief, practices of courage, practices of discernment, practices of compassion. Uh, these things tend to be strongest in liminal time. But also in liminal time, what can happen is people lose it. I mean, literally every great saint, every great religious guru, everybody who's ever talked about liminal space knows that people become unhinged uh, in liminal time. And that's why sometimes you send, for example, the warrior away uh, during a sort of a liminal spiritual exercise to go to uh, a, on a vision quest away from the rest of the community because you know that that person who is in that liminal space can be so disruptive or, and even violent towards the rest of the people who aren't in the exact same space. And so, 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 our, so that's where we are. And what's interesting about this is it's not just like one or two people who happen to be in liminality right now, but as there, there are several global cultures which are in liminal space. Uh, Islam's various communities are in liminal time. We've known that um, for about 20 years now. And they're in liminal time between conventional uh, construction of Islam theologically and communally and being part of the technological modern economic world. They've been in liminal space. And Europeans are in liminal space about what are we going to do with what we've inherited from the enlightenment, which doesn't seem to work or carried racism and white supremacy with it. And we don't know what our story is now. And so what are we gonna do? You have the word, China is in liminal time between what they were and what they're becoming. And so say you have the world's three greatest cultural blocks um, in liminal time, all at the same time, is that you have three groups of people in ethnic, historical, theological, political traditions um, who are all historically dislocated at the same moment. And that's, wow. where we, that's where we are. And it's within those moments that we used to send vision, people on vision quests so that they could have all the visions they wanted to off away from the rest of us and then come back and reintegrate into community. Yeah. But now, where are we going to send anybody? 
there's, there's no place to go. And everybody is having every vision possible all here right now. And we're all doing this with one another. And there is no sense of clarity. And of course, violence uh, results from that. And, and so I think that means for you and me uh, and for places like St. Luke's to understand that we are, we are now liminal Episcopalians. That's where we live. What do we have to offer in liminal time to help create a life-giving, truthful, and beautiful environments where people can navigate dislocation? Wow, 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 wow. I'm just, what, how do we give our people and what do we give our people to navigate dislocation? Um, is it too reductionistic, Diana, to say that uh, another way, another metaphor to use for saying what you just say, said about liminality is that we're living between two stories? Um, or two narratives that that's that's from Charles Eisenstein who says that the myth of the separate self or the narrative of the separate self is dying and what is coming up is the the story of interbeing um, and interconnectivity which of course John Philip Newell says was all there all along in Celtic Christianity and spirituality um, just a word about reflecting on that idea of living between two stories I think that's true, and um, I don't even know if we're living between them as much as we are. There's a some people who are trying to reprise the old story, and I think there are some people who have moved far more comfortably into the new story. Yeah. And so, um, personally, I don't necessarily feel like I'm living between them. I feel like I am living. Um, in a story of interconnection and interbeing. I don't know always how to do that. I've still been learning how to do it. Um, but I feel like in some level I have, and Grounded, the book that you mentioned at the beginning is actually my narration of moving towards, the, moving into that story. Um, so, so I don't feel like I'm between them, but maybe a lot of people do. Um, I don't feel that way personally, but I do see that I'm kind of fighting the, the the rearticulations of the of the story the other story and there are there are i think kind of benign rearticulations of the other story and i think there are very dangerous rearticulations of the other story and i suspect that's true over here too i think that there are probably you and i know lots of people moving into the new story who are healthy thoughtful loving compassionate amazing people and who are bringing our very best to that story. But I also sense that there's probably dark forces that can gather in any story. And so, so yeah, I buy that, you know, I, That's I, a, I agree with you. I appreciate the, the splash of cold water that says there are dark forces, there are evil forces that can coalesce in any story. That's correct. And we need, not to be romanticizing any particular story and you know for all of augustine's problems and <laughs> he did say uh, and also um it'll, it'll come to me the great solzhenitsyn said that um the line between good and evil runs through the center of every human heart that's correct and we simply cannot romanticize that I'm in the the saved group. I'm in the great group. And that is what I critique. The, the narrative I received, the religious narrative I received was the dualistic manichaeism, is that right? Uh, manichaeistic thing of evil and good, flesh and spirit, and the saved and the not saved uh, people going to whose eternal address is going to be heaven or hell. And what you're saying is that we can just 
screw up anything. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and also that, the, and, and we're really out of time, but I'm stretching us a little bit. I just want to re-emphasize that stunning statement you said earlier is that in this new reworking of thinking, the way we think and the way we act and the way we advocate for the common good, that the heaven hell stuff is no longer around. It's about being true to your culture and that that is some form of reward, you know, that, that doesn't appeal to me, but you're saying that it's really active in this pre-Christian pagan kind of thing that is so very real. And I think it has snuck over pretty significantly into this kind of Trumpian authoritarian white evangelicalism. And I think it has also snuck into um, this hierarchical anti-Pope Francis form of white Catholicism as well. Because if you betray true what it means to be truly catholic or if you betray what it means to be truly christian with the evangelicals they just think they're christians um you know is that that's that's a huge sin and they all have elements of their cultures i think this is places where they coalesce um along with this you know norse warrior thing is that you know catholics are these kinds of catholics are literally calling for a new crusade uh, crusader Catholicism is what they refer to it as, and that's all over the internet. Um, and then, of course, evangelicals have been are, are very apocalyptic um, in this view, and you know have long seen people as you know warriors for Christ, bear, you know waving the sword of the Lord, uh, bringing in the the final battle of Armageddon. And so there is there is and still there still is that kind of battle mentality, uh, which is valorized in um, Trumpian white evangelicalism. And <clears throat> I, I just do want to say that I have a painful memory of having a very impassioned conversation with a young 20 something, I think he was, about Jesus. And he literally believed in a machine gun toting Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to talk about a Beatitudes oriented Jesus. And we were talking about two very different realities. Yeah. And you he, sell out. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and you see, you see people showing up who are carrying a cross and a machine gun in Washington, D.C. on Epiphany. And it makes perfect sense within their story. Yes, yes. And it is a story that for them is real, although those of us who are still holding on to some shreds of the Enlightenment understand that there is a lack of correspondence between the facts of the world and the story they're trying to live in the midst of that world. And, there be, you know, and that starts tearing it. Yeah. the fabric of reality the facts of the world well diana thank you uh this has been so enlightening it's felt like two minutes and golly moses did you pack a bunch of stuff in thank god it's on video and we will invite you back um uh, for other conversations and also a, a class or two so god bless you for all the work you do god bless you god bless you god bless you i know yeah. sometimes you get attacked <laughs> and um just for talking about what you've learned and yeah. and and you have persisted yet yeah, she has persisted <laughs> and, uh, thanks for all those 11 books and thanks for this time and thanks especially for your friendship to me well ed i you know i i I think so highly of you and, you know, honestly, and I can say it on tape, I love you. You're a great brother and a great friend and a wonderful mentor. And uh, I not only uh, enjoy our friendship, but I look up to you and, and uh, I'm happy. I'm happy to be here and serve uh, the people you serve. Thanks, my friend. Deep bows. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.